this book, um, this book, Religion of the Teutons, investigates how Teutonic mythology has shown up again and again in um, in the history. He starts in about 1621 uh, with a Scottish clergyman, R. Kirk, elves, fauns, and fairies. It's kind of a study of the Celtic people and their beliefs in that area. And then um, he gets on with another guy, Herman Usner. Um, and I couldn't find him on Wikipedia, but I found him on the Danish Wikipedia. And he wrote a book about Epicurus. And that one, I thought, um, what I found truly interesting was the fact that he was one of the teachers of, my goodness, I lost it. He, I got to looking at who he was. One of his students was Frederick Nietzsche. Now, when he wrote Epicurus, I wondered, he was a philosopher at the time. He dealt with um, pleasure. His idea of pleasure was a life lived without pain, so on and so forth. Not the merrymaking, drinking idea that many people consider a pleasurable life. But I'm reading through these, yep, matter of fact, I'm going to share it. can't share it. There it is. I'm reading through this these quotes of this Epicurean philosophy, and I'm finding where Nietzsche come up with much of what he wrote. Um, the true art of living well and the art of dying well are one. Vain is the word of philosopher that does not heal any suffering in man, any suffering of man. And he continues on and on. And all of these are fantastic. Now, when I first got into Austin True, I, I had I remember getting an argument with the man that said the uh, entirety of the Havamal was a reprint of something that come out of Rome, and he posted it. And indeed, they were very similar. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be, if they were that valuable as seeds of wisdom or kernels of truth, wouldn't they be represented in all kinds of cultures? Wouldn't they show up in some form there? Which That's something that the entirety of that argument that I find with these individuals has to do with a basis in ego, how right they think they are, how much they can justify their position. But anyone that's paying attention to this, I, I would highly encourage you to take a look at this very um, interesting set of quotes, um, especially about friendship. The noble man is chiefly concerned with wisdom and friendship. Of these, the former is a mortal good and the latter an immortal one. So Epicurus felt that friendship being based in all friendships are, begins with need. Um, was one of the chief sources of happiness, this building of tribe. He talks about the gods and this is from 20, 2300 bees. I mean, this is old stuff, very old stuff. Um, Self-reliance. So I'm, I'm looking at this stuff that's hundreds of years BC, and I'm finding the same kind of principles that we want to follow. Self-reliance, industriousness, the building of tribe, hospitality. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff all that stuff ties together. So in every ancient culture, we find this. And indeed, when I wrote my second, third book, Ingu's Developing the God Seed, the Ing, that, that's such an interesting part of much of the English language, be Ing, do Ing, see Ing, hear Ing, all of these things that we do uh, are conducive to the development of that, of uh, Ingu's, that divine seed of, of the God within us. So I highly encourage anyone that has an interest, read through some of that. There's some, some real interesting stuff. One of the key things that I think is interesting is that when we begin to look from the outside into our chosen faith and spirituality, and we find these commonalities, and the position we have regarding this faith is not one based on ego, we begin to connect the dots, as it were, with regards to our own path in life. So I can look at that. It is no threat to me whatsoever to say, hey, there's some common elements here that are conducive to the development of the entire person, including me. I don't lose anything from that. I'm not afraid of that. I can still stand on my own feet and say, these are, the, these are the people that I choose to associate with. 
<laughs> but on death, it says, I have anticipated you, fortune, and entrenched myself against all your secret attacks, and we will not give ourselves up as captives to you or to any other circumstance. But when it is time for us to go, spitting contempt on life, and on those who here vainly cling to you, I cry aloud in a glorious triumph song that we have lived well. I can think of no better, now there's probably a bunch of them, right now in this moment that one right there man that's a way to go out isn't it that's the way to do things that's how we're supposed to be living this life i spoke with um, one of the most important aspects of that and i spoke with my go with these students this <laughs> we were talking about the gift of owned the gift of breath and the breathing when we look at those gifts we've been cultivated, that we've been given, they seem kind of vague and nebulous. How might they be the guide to higher levels of consciousness or more developed spiritual prowess or spirituality or, or this faith as it were? And we started really simply with breath. Everything around us seems to be con connected with water i.e. lagoons, and I've gone over that extensively. But I have never really discussed the medium in which we thrive and survive, that being air. We can't really see it. We, can smell, we, we might smell it, but air, what we breathe through. Like a fish doesn't know that he's wet. We're walking through this medium. We only see 2% of the visible light. And yet if we stop breathing, we lose our life. And we put no focus on that. We put no importance on the cultivation of our ability to breathe. And when I say that the ability to breathe allows us to cultivate more spiritual, more spirituality, a deeper understanding of life um, and physical health, how does that work? How does that happen? Well, let me put it to you this way. If you're the kind of individual that decides to meditate, if you're the kind of individual that recognizes that sharp intake of breath at an aha moment, if you're the kind of individual that realizes that sharp intake of breath with a yawn or a moment of fear or terror or that rapid beating of the heart and the quickening of the breath uh, in a moment of love, um, breath plays a vital interest. Your heart starts pumping the fluid of our body, the liquid, our lagoons, which is most of the blood, uh, um, uh, goodly color that we're given by by vey. But also it works in conjunction with breath. So the two go hand in hand. If you were to sit down and try to meditate and you begin to focus on the slow inhale and exhale of your breath, you can't be thinking about the past and you can't be thinking about the future. If you're sitting here entertaining some kind of feeling and your body's being flooded with chemicals by some memory, something that literally does not exist. It does, it, it, it's, it's, it's no longer there. Or entertaining some anxiety about something you think might happen in the future. You're ruining your ability to breathe in this moment and be fully present in this moment, to feel everything you're supposed to feel. So much of our life is dedicated to the pursuit of avoiding pain. How do I get around it? How do I not deal with it? How do I avoid it? And yet all of our gods talk to us about dealing with pain. All of our gods set that example of sacrificing a hand, of losing an eye, of all kinds of things. Our gods give us all kinds of examples of facing it straight on to become something more. Now, if we're to cultivate a thought process, breath, air, that breath of inspiration, and indeed, in the Bible in the Old Testament doesn't become Abraham until he receives the breath of inspiration which is the H in his name when he becomes Abraham. That's when he becomes, receives that divine. So the breath is a real important thing. That's how we begin to leave life crying aloud in a glory song that we have lived well. <laughs> we don't spend it wasted in the past. We don't spend it dealing with the anxiety and uncertainty of the future, something that hasn't even come to pass yet. We deal with this moment right here and right now. And in this moment, right here and right now, it seems to be okay. But what about the warrior? 
What about the shield man? What about the individual that spends a good portion of their life preparing to battle? They're going to go away some long to some foreign shore. They're going to engage in military operations of some kind, and it's quite likely they're going to die. Or they might survive. How would you best get someone to deal with that? Can you, I mean, it's hard enough jumping out of the side of a helicopter or into a crevasse or hanging off the side of a cliff or any other number of things. How best do you cultivate the strength of mind necessary to walk through streets and engage in military operations because someone you don't know, knowing full well that if you lose, you will be buried in a mass grave and you will most likely be forgotten. All of your weapons will be bent or damaged and thrown into the river because they didn't help you win a victory. Well, they're not going to help anybody else win a victory and they're thrown into the river. The mass grave. How do you convince someone to willingly risk going into the mass grave and lose the prospect of going to the halls of their ancestors? <laughs> See, the straw of death wasn't always and probably still shouldn't be considered a bad thing. Yes, you simply pass through these doors and you enter the halls of your ancestors where all of these people that are in your family line should be welcoming you. This is where we entertain them with great stories of what we've done, how we've lived, so on and so forth. But not so for the soldier. There's a real possibility that he's just going to be pushed into a hole with all of his buddies if he loses the fight. And that's it. So we must go back into prehistory for some of this. When wars began to become commonplace between men, and they have been since we became patriarchal, when you had that great Venus figurine from 20 to 30,000, 40,000 years ago in Europe, you had the stone card figurines of the very full woman with the large bosom and the and the wide hips and the and the and the full belly and the wide thighs. That's a that's a woman who is that's a goddess. All of her life giving characteristics. She's capable of giving life. She's capable of feeding life. She's capable of carrying life. She is the matriarchal aspect of Stone Age kind of Europe. The great mother. She was so important that they call greens of only one other hard figurine found from about 40,000 years ago in Europe, and it was in Czechoslovakia, and it was a lion-headed man. So we had to consider that somewhere along the way there was a transition as societies began to get bigger, as settlements began to develop, and as settlements had to be defended, as resources that began to compete with res for resources, given the limited agricultural status that people had, their ability to do just so much to feed the tribe, everything was shared, everything was important, more resources were needed. It became a patriarchal society as the man become the very prominent producer, he could go and raid and create more. So the man with the longest, strongest, most powerful spear is probably going to be the winner. Which is why Odin has Gungnir. He could kill a mammoth with Gungnir. Before that it was Tyr. <laughs> well, what you do is you create somewhere along the way, somehow, somewhere, that's the logical perspective of Valhalla. You create a special place for them to go when they die. And it's not going to be a place that's full of wisdom. It's not going to be a place full of peace and enlightenment. It's going to be the kind of heaven that those men that are in the warrior stage of their life will understand the most. It may not have the same appeal to a man who is a father. It will not have the same appeal to a king. It will not have the same appeal to a sage who is preparing himself to take that long walk with the gods or whatever that might look like. So it's not for everyone. It's a unique, special heaven. For Gephion, those that die maidens, they attend her. She has a special place, a heaven of her own for those, for those girls. Freya has, Freya has Folkvanger. Odin also has Vingolf and Valhalla. He has two halls of the slain. Freya has one. So there's a unique idea among the three of them 
Even Rand has one for drowned sailors. She gets all of them unlucky bastards. <laughs> but for the warrior mindset, it's a woman. For those young men who still haven't completely separated from the idea of, of their mother being the primary woman in their life, there's Frey with Wolfbanger. For those men who have done so, there's Vingal and Valhalla. <laughs> well, let's discuss some of that tonight. I can't see it, so I'm going to stop the share because I can't see what I'm reading here. Thank you. So then said Ganglary, thou sayest that all those men who have fallen in battle from the beginning of the world are now come to Odin and Valhalla. What has he to give them for food? I should think that there a very great host must be there. Then Har answered, that thou which sayest is true, a very mighty multitude is there, but many more shall be, notwithstanding which it will seem all too small in the time when the wolf shall come. But never is so vast a multitude in Valhalla that the flesh of that boar shall fail, which is called Sam, Sam Rimnir. He is boiled every day and is whole at evening. So right now, this is just about how they left off Vingolf and Fulgwinger, which they meet, meet, mentioned uh, earlier in the Eddas. But he says it's a very mighty multitude is there, and many more shall come, but it's still not going to be enough at the end of all things. And that's important for us to consider. When it's time, it's time. You put everything you can into staving off death, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be able to do a single thing to stop it or slow it down or impede the renewing of the cycle, which I think is a far more critical concept to understand. The cycle will be renewed. And while we might prepare against it, we still need to understand if we sit around and worry about that, we're wasting our breath, we're wasting our energy, entertaining anxiety about something which has not come to pass, something about which we cannot do a single thing. The cycle will begin anew. Who knows what it looks like? <laughs> and the boar, now in the Middle East, it's very hard to preserve pork. It spoils rapidly in the desert and it became tainted me, causing sickness and death, and it became vilified by much of the Abrahamic face because they couldn't preserve it. You couldn't salt it enough to save it in that festering heat. But in the north, where the temperatures got cool, you could dig down a little bit, you could create a salt cellar, you could preserve pork. And indeed, the idea that Frey, this god of abundance, and Freya both have boars that shine or are important to man, um, there is a legend that the boar rooting in the earth allowed men to plant seeds in the first furrows, providing a constant source of abundance, abundance and replenishment. As they rooted through the forest, they created holes in which your early man could plant something and it would grow and he could harvest it. So it became very beneficial between the two of them. So you have the, the gentle rains to water everything and you have the great furrows dug by the great boars. And you have man coming along it's well fertilized with manure. It's a hole. You can fill it, put a seed in it and grow something. <laughs> in the prehistoric ideas, what an amazing thing. Now we begin to understand the origins of agriculture in that region as being, a benef as being an offset of the boar and Frey and Freya, these god and goddesses, these vanic gods and goddesses of abundance and prosperity. But the boar is here too in Valhalla. They have a feast every night. Bacon is good. I don't give a shit what anybody says. Bacon is good. I'm not a big fan of ham, but I do like some ribs. And they get to eat it every night. <laughs> if you're a soldier and you're marching on the trail, you're not eating in abundance. You're eating just, you're getting enough calories. And today it's an MRE. Back then it might have been hard tack and water. Some other time it might have been occasional wine with uh, salted pork or some kind of meat. But if you can't carry that much food. If you're going on a long march, you're traveling for war, you're not able to carry that kind of abundance on your back. It simply isn't possible. But you have to feed an army, so you have to balance out how much can I feed them to keep them moving, to be ready, to win the big fight at the end. Von Clausewitz, the German, uh, German general, I don't know if he was a general or not, but Von Clausewitz, I think he was a Prussian officer, excuse me wrote the book on that kind of 
of the ability to move an army in, in his book on war. <laughs> so here we have the opportunity to not be hungry. And for a soldier that's marching all the time, hunger is something you deal with. You're going to be hungry. You're going to keep going. And at the end, maybe there's going to be a feast. So there's the first thing we need to look at. For your regular person who all he has to do is go to the store and buy whatever he needs to, uh, having a boar to boil every night, that may not be quite as important to them as it is for a 150-pound soldier carrying a 70-pound ruck and M16, a full load of ammunition, and five quarts of water. <clears throat> But this question which thou askest now, I think it likely that few may be so wise as to be able to report truthfully concerning it. So right there we have an interesting idea because this is the afterlife. This is a version of what's gone on before that we can't answer that truthfully. His name who roasts is Adhrimnir, and the kettle is Eldrimnir, so is said here. Andromir has an Eldromir, Sam Ramir Sodden, best of hams, yet few know how yet ha, yet how few know with what food the champions are fed. So it's kind of a guess. He admits it, it's a guess right there. So the guy that roasts the great pig, Andromir, and they does so in a kettle Eldromir. These days I'll look up what those names mean. Because <laughs> I'm sure that all three of them, like many other things in spirituality, there's a three there. And you will, you will usually find a triumvirate of some kind of sacred deities in just about every mythology you come across in the world. Um, but here in this afterlife in Valhalla, you find three, Sam Hrimnir, the pig, and Hrimnir, the, the, the butcher and the cook, and El Hrimnir, the pot in which it boils. I'm certain that if anyone ever took a look at that, they would find a real interesting dynamic triumvirate that supports many of the theories we hold. Then said Ganglary, has Odin the same fare as the champions? Har answered, that food which stands on his board, he gives to two wolves, which he has, called Gary and Freki. But no food does he need. Wine is both food and drink to him. So it says here, Gary means the ravener the ravener, the ravenous hunger. Uh, Frankie means glutton or greedy. Gary and Frankie, the war mighty gluttoneth, the glorious god of hosts, but on wine alone, the weapon glorious Odin, I, I live it. The weapon glorious Odin. So in this scenario, with these young warriors, he is well suited for war. Two ravenous wolves, wolves devour the battlefield along with the ravens. The ravens sit on his shoulders and say into his ear all tidings, tidings which they see or hear. They are called thus, Hugin and Munin. He sends them at daybreak to fly about the world, and they come back at Undern Meal. Thus he is acquainted with many tidings. Now there is another Edda called Odin's Korpgalder. And many people consider it to be a late edition sometime around the 18th century of, and it may well be, but you have to bear in mind that by the 18th century, there were no less than a thousand different books that covered Teutonic mythology and all dating as far back as 1691. But for the most part, almost all of them, matter of fact, indeed all of them served a purpose in line with the political correctness thought of the time. Some of them may be to upend it. Some of them may have been in full support of it. But for the most part during the 18th century, it was a justification of colonial Europe and superior prowess. And it continues on in many ways. But I'm going to, I'm going to put this, read this to you about Odin's court welder and Odin's two ravens, Hugin and Munin, mind and memory. And this is from Mary Elise Tichenell of the Theosophy. She's a Theosophist, which was originated by Madame Blavatsky and her Theosophical movement during the late 18th century where she attempted to tie the Hindu ideas with the Norse or pagan ideas. But he, and this is the Odin's court builder. This is after Ragnarok. Odin's two ravens, Hugin and Munin, 
daily fly over the battlefield earth and report to all father by night. Here we again find a mention of the God's anxiety for Hugin, lest he fail to return. And there is cogent reason for this. Mind entails choice. Beings who possess this faculty, who have attained the function of intelligence and free will, as has humanity on earth, are faced with the options these presents. They can, if they so choose, ally themselves totally with the matter side of nature. The giants, in extreme cases, severing their connection with their inner gods so that they so that their characteristic contribution to the cosmic purpose is lost. These people completely consumed with materialist ideals. These people completely consumed with egotistical pre pre you know, conceptions of who they think they are, wrapped up in what they own and what they possess as what makes them important in this world. They are severing their tie with that ing, that God seed within everybody. <laughs> And an important thing to note, though, is that even that individual, even that lowly individual who has separated themselves from the inner God, that giant in the Heimlugoth, when Freya begins to escort Otter along to a great reward or whatever it is, a mighty boon from Odin or Thor, she picks the lowest form of that kind of individual, a woman who lit literally lives under a rock. Now, Freya, the goddess of abundance and prosperity and love, calls her sister which is an important thing to remember. This divine being does not present harm. She understands where this individual is, calls her sister, calls her out from another rock. But she does so because even that individual understands that Otter, much like all of us, have a mighty heritage. And she calls him a fool for not knowing it when this very simplistic individual already knows it and he's forgot. This is the nature of, of Hugin. Or they can gradually, be, so they be, the opportunity to become immortal, or they can gradually blend with the divine source of their existence. The critical choice is not made all at once. It is the cumulative effect of numberless small choices made through the progressive stages of life. Success is not a goal. Success is doing things a little bit better today than you did yesterday. Tomorrow's not here yet. You don't know if you're even going to see tomorrow. But today, if you've done it a little bit better than you did yesterday, if you've handled those things which are causing you pain and difficulty today better than you did yesterday, if you've achieved a goal, if you have taken a step, if you have made some kind of success in your life and did it today, this is part of those numberless small choices made through the progressive stages of life. <laughs> For the warriors who are fallen to go to Valhalla, their numberless small choices stop right there. So the course of their development and masculinity does not go on beyond the idea, the mindset, the mentality of a war. And the natural course of growth, the soul unites with each increment experience with this divine source and so little by little merges with it. Now, I don't know about all that, but I do know that as we make those numberless small choices, as we continue to enjoy success and we move forward, we find ourselves more and more capable of utilizing the gifts of Odin, Vili, and Ve. And is this breath owned both La and Lita Gotha. <laughs> and that means being right here and right now. So Odin doesn't need food, he just drinks wine. Okay? He sends them at, so Hugin and Munin, he sends them at daybreak, daybreak to fly about all the world. And they come back and under mail, and thus he's acquainted with many tidings. Therefore, men call him Raven God, as is said. Hugin and Munin and Hoover each day, the wide earth over. I fear for Hugin, lest he fare not back. Yet watch I more for Munin. So why would he watch more for Munin? So he fears for the return of thought but he fears more that he might never get his memory back. I find that particularly poignant today in a time when we have so many people dealing with Alzheimer's who lose their memory. They can still think, but they have no memory of who they are or where they come from. And indeed, <laughs> as a people, there's a great deal of amnesia about where we come from. How do we cultivate and develop and remember these these, how do we bring these memories back to the forefront of our minds? 
by cultivating those gifts, by reading these stories. <laughs> now, indeed, much of it as we read these stories is nothing more than a reminiscence. We're not garnering wisdom just by reading that. We've got to discuss it. We've got to work with the mentor. We've got to work with each other. We've got to build friendships that allow for the give and take of this kind of knowledge. This is how we develop this memory. This is how we rekindle the ideas of memory, of thought and memory. We might lose the ability to think, remember. Which one would you want be more the fearful for? Um, it's something well worth thinking about as a people with, a, with the amnesia that we have, this memory is returning to us. Then said Ganglary, what have the champions to drink that may suffice them as abundantly as the food or as water drunk there? Then said Har, now thou ask strangely as if all father would invite to him kings or earls or other men of might and would give them water to drink. Interesting. I know by my faith that many a man comes to Valhalla who would think he had brought his drink of water dearly, if he were not better, to che if he were not better cheer to be had there, he who before had suffered wounds and burning pain unto death. I can tell thee a different tale of this. The she goat, who is called Hydron, stands up in Valhalla and bites the needles from the limb of that tree, which is very famous, and is called Leradir. Led can't pronounce that, Leradir. And from her udders, meads run so copiously that she fills a tune every day. That tune is so great that all the champions become quite drunk from it. This is one of the first, so it's interesting here to, to point out. <laughs> if you're gonna create a heaven for these men that fall in battle, a painful and burning death, if you're going to invite the kings, the earls, and the men of might, who would, would you give them water to drink? Is that the best you could do? Why no? So one of the first animals we kind of come across, aside from Ratatosk, who is in Valhalla, who is in the Igris, or in Igrisil, is this goat, this silly goat. <laughs> it stands up in Valhalla and eats the needles of the limb of that tree, which is very famous. Well, an ash doesn't have needles, but a yew does. And I think it's important to note that much of the idea of Igrisil being an ash is incorrect. Um, one of the, there's a lot of research and a lot of modern scholarly approach that suggests that you, that the Igrisil is a yew tree. And, in, and indeed, over much of Europe, you will find yew trees in these ancient churchyards that are much older than the church. In France, there's a yew tree that's, um, it's inside is so hollow, they have stained glass windows in it, they have they have an altar in it, they have a little church inside the trunk of this yew tree, it's so vast. Um, the yew taxonomists in Europe, in the summertime, some, have, if you've ever smelled cedar or pine, the yew tree also gives off a kind of an oil factory uh, idea or, or scent, but it also happens to be kind of toxic and will produce a slight hallucinogenic effect. And they have said, suggested that Odin hanging on this yew tree, ingesting this slightly hallucinogenic um, uh, scent from the yew is what produced the idea of shedding, sacrificing himself to himself, hearing the songs of his ancestors, picking up the rooms. This is not also an uncommon occurrence for much of shamanic and um, Gothies in Central America. These, all, these substances that create altered states of consciousness Many of them will suggest that it is a reduction of the ego. It is a reduction of the idea that we think who we are. And it is more along the lines of bringing us back into ourselves. And that's an interesting dynamic that most people, we never really catch that. We don't want to catch that because, well, we wouldn't be quite as important if everybody else was doing it, would we? And yet the science is there. The research is there. The scholarly approach is there. <laughs> So the, the warriors get their drink of mead. And who wouldn't want mead? Like I say, after you've been on a long road march, after you've marched into war, uh, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you don't want just water to drink. After you've been outside working all day, people want to crack open a cold beer. If you've been mowing the lawn or working, people want to crack open a cold beer and have a cold. 
it's not uncommon. I personally don't engage in it, but a good drink of mead at a ceremony, they have no more, they have no more challenges in front of them other than their daily battle. They're going to feast and they're going to drink the mindset of the warrior. <laughs> then said Ganglary, that is a wondrous proper goat for them. It must be an exceeding good tree from which she eats. And it is. Then said Har, even more worthy of note is that heart's Hyphrini, which stands in Valhau and bites from the limbs of the tree, and from his horns distills such abundant exudation that it comes down into Virgilmir. And from thence fall those rivers called the Seed Vid, Sulkin, Eichen, Zval, Gunthra, Fjorm, Fimblethol, Gipple, Gopal, Gomel, and Gervamal. Those fall about the abodes of the Aesir. So those are the rivers that come from the Virgilmir is the bubbling spring under the tree, and those rivers run into, into Asgard. Those are the, the divine rivers that run into Asgard. Those are the rivers that Thor crosses to meet with the host every day. <laughs> and these are also recorded Thin, Vin, Thal, Hald, Rad, Gunthrain, Nit, Not, Non, Hron, Vina, Vegsvin, Hyodnuma. And those are the other rivers that run out of Hergomer. So, what is an abundant exudation? Why would, why would so much water, so much powerful joy, abundant exudation? So have you ever seen someone who is so at peace with themselves, so happy that they, they exude kind of a light, kind of shines about them, they're at peace. And similarly, you can see people that are in pain because it kind of comes off of them. We may not visibly see it, but sometimes people can feel when people are happy. We can feel it when we get next to them. So here's a heart. Here's a great big deer standing in this tree, eating of Yggdrasil that gives off such an abundant exudation from his antlers that it literally creates the rivers. Imagine, if you will, I'm not going to go into that. We'll do that some other time. But the source of the rivers that run through Asgard and many through the world are the abundant exudation, this happiness, this satisfaction, this gratitude, this wonderful, powerful, positive spiritual energy that uh, comes from the comes from from Yggdrasil into the rivers that flow through both worlds, Asgard and Midgard. Um, that. That conduit for spiritual energy, that conduit for spiritual positivity comes from the deer. From this deer in, in, the, in Yggdrasil. And it's worthy of research. Anyone that one wants to look more into it ought to. Because that's what an odd word to show up. Abundant exudation that it comes down into Virgilmere. That suggests that this bubbling spring from which all these rivers emerge has more than one source itself. And one of them means it comes down from the rain from this, the antlers of this great stag that lives in Yggdrasil. Then said Gangleri, these are marvelous tidings which now thou tellest. A wondrous great house of Alhalla must be. It must be exceeding crowded before the doors. Then said Har answered, why dost thou not ask how many doors there are in the hall, or how great? And that's interesting to note, too. He didn't, he just made this suggestion hoping for an answer. He didn't just ask. Sometimes when we're living in life, instead of trying to figure out, trying to worry and focus on the problem, he's focusing on the problem. Well, it must be exceeding crowded in there. He's creating an idea that, well, I might be able to do a little bit better than you. I wouldn't have created something that would be so crowded. Or asks him, why don't you just ask how many doors are in the hall? Why don't we just ask what kind of future we ought to be building for ourselves? Why don't we just ask from these gods, where am I supposed to go? Has somebody said we shouldn't on social media? Because somebody said the gods don't care about us? And yet they've given us all of these many gifts. From the three from Odin, Vili, and Ve, again from Rig, again from Freya, again from Gefion, and when she married into the royalty of Europe, again from uh, Rig Jarl and Cone Rig himself, who founded the Danish kingdoms. Again and again, we see wonderful gifts show up, 
and we're supposed to say, well, they don't really care. We shouldn't ask anything. Paul right here, hi, says, why dost thou not ask how many doors there are in the hall or how great? If thou hearest that told, then that will say that it is strange indeed if whosoever will may not go out and in, but it may be said truly that it is no more crowded to find a place therein than to enter into it. That's, that's a heck of a tang, tangled sentence word there. I mean, word sentence there. I mean, that, that's hard to read. Here's one that I like to in, in use, and I picked it up uh, 30 years ago in Alcoholics Anonymous. When it says that we found the realm of the spirit to be broad and roomy and all inclusive. And this is truly a fitting thing here for any warrior who dies. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he's a Nazi or not. If he dies in battle, this is his heaven. This is the heaven of the warrior. 500 doors and 40 more, so I deem shall stand in Valhalla. 800 champions go out each door when, fare they, when they fare to fight with the wolf. Then said Gangleria, a very mighty multitude of men is Valhalla, so that by my faith, Odin is a very great chieftain, and he is, since he commands so large an army. Remember, he has a ring that drops eight more just like it every ninth night. You have to be a very powerful chieftain to call that many warriors to you, and yet here he's calling fully half of the dead every night. <coughs> Now, what is the sport of the champions when they are not fighting? Paul replied, every day, as soon as they are clothed, they straightway put on their armor and go out onto the court and fight and fell each other. That is their sport. And when the time draws near to under and mill, they ride home to Valhalla and sit down to drink, even as said here. All the Ainin are in Odin's court deal out blows every day. They slain the slain they choose and ride from the strife, sit later together, sit later in love together. Isn't that something? It's one of the few places you see love talked about in the lore. And we're talking about fallen warriors here. There's a unique thing about men that have been under extreme duress of combat is that they, they develop an unabashed love for each other. And I don't mean the kind of gay stuff that everybody wants to call, but I'm talking about these are men that understand the shared experiences of fear more than most people can imagine, more than most, what most people only ever see in a movie. These men go out and do it every day. There's honor among each other. They both, they all go out there and give it their best. You can find a portion of it if you go into any legitimate gym that teaches men how to fight each other, men and women. Um, those that stick with it, those that have the discipline to cultivate it, they begin to earn the respect they are accorded honor. They don't give it to themselves. They are accorded honor by others for their efforts. And that kind of respect breeds trust. That kind of friendship cultivates love. So now the warrior mind, the warrior who's alone, who's on a long march to fight a big battle, has a clear idea that he's still gonna be around people he loves. I think that's one of the things that scares us the most about all of this after we pass through. Will I be alone? How do I understand how to deal with life without the give and take of those around me? Well, in this particular heaven, these men struggle against each other and then they sit later in love together. But what thou hast said is true. Odin is great of might. Many examples are found in proof of this as is here said in the words of the Aesir himself. Ash Yggdrasil's trunk of trees is foremost, and Skeb Bladnir of ships, Odin of the Aesir of all steeds Sleipnir, Bifrost of bridges and Bragi of scalds, Habrak of hawks and of hounds garmer. And from there it goes on into many other things. <laughs> when we talk about the afterlife of, of this, of the Valhalla, you're talking about a very particular, very unique, very stunted course of development for the individual who engages in literal combat. You're not talking about the individual who's fighting cancer. You're not talking about the individual who's dealing with anything else. This is a particular special place for warriors who die in combat, who have lost all the blood and who they are 
on some foreign battlefield in a moment of sheer terror. They will find a place amongst other warriors who have also felt that fear and they will sit later in love together. And that's a wonderful thing to me. Valhalla is not that heaven for everybody. We don't all get to go there. Any of us sitting here, we have halls of our ancestors to entertain us after our passing or so we've been told. Who really knows what it looks like. But in Valhalla, in that, in that in that particular heaven that appeals most to those men who are in the warrior stage, the warrior mindset, that young man kind of idea. <laughs> he has scantily clad women and pork and beer and they're going to battle every day. That has no appeal, should have no appeal to a man in his late 40s. It should have no appeal to a woman who is a good mother. It should have no appeal to the old man who has many grandchildren and great grandchildren. Well, our version of what comes next should look much, much different because we have thought and we have memory each day to tell us what's going on in the world. So on, on Valhalla, I think that's about all I got. If anyone has any questions or wants to tell me I'm wrong, I'd be happy to listen to it um, and we can discuss it from there. I'm going to unmute you, Heather, stinker. I guess not. Go ahead and unmute him, Melissa. I am. Just there we go. Ah. Hi. Hey, Heather. How you doing? You still working late? You still working late, huh? Oh yeah. You gonna wrap Hi. it up? Hi. How you guys doing? Does anybody have any questions or arguments about anything that I said this evening? I do not, but thank you because you know what? That stuff has come up a lot in some some of the groups I was in. I actually took myself out because I got tired of hearing them. But they were talking a lot about that this week. About mm -hmm. the whole concept of Valhalla and what happens when you die and all of that. So that was that was really cool. And I thank you. I think that's one of the things when they talked about the fear of memory uh, not coming back. That's that's our real great challenge, isn't it? I mean, that's, I mean, really and truly, if we look at all this, it's easy to sit around and stand on the circle and raise a horn and hope for the best and live a life of expected phenomena. But when the rubber meets the road and it's time to go, now what? I don't think any, there was a, when my grandfather died, um, the, the, the hospice nurse and my mom were like, Carl, do you want to get a, do you want to get a minister to hear your final words? And uh, after a while he said, okay. And then when the minister called, asked if he could come over, grandpa said, no. I've lived this long this way. I'm not going to change it now. And I was like, my gosh, what, a, what an act of courage. What a legitimate act of courage. This was a man that only believed in the sun because the sun powers everything on this planet. And in the final moment, he didn't buckle. He didn't capitulate. He didn't change his mind. He didn't do what everybody else did. This man who said, you know what? I'm going to stand by my words. I've said all along, because that was his biggest complaint about Christians. They could be an asshole, criminal, thug, piece of shit their entire lives and then about 30 minutes before they die wait a minute i'm going to change it all and get i'm going to go to heaven this is awesome what a deal man what a deal praise and, the uh, lord yeah so he so he uh he didn't he didn't change his mind and i, I i'm so glad my grandfather set that example for me and i and so but i mean back to the point that's our challenge, isn't it? We've got to get a memory back of what this is supposed to look like after we go on because there's people that need that kind of, not everybody has that kind of moral fortitude. Not everyone has that kind of serious commitment. For many of those people you see arguing about that, this is uh, convenient. This is kind of edgy and cool. And it's a source where they can build their ego based on folkish or universalist, or they can be more important because they understand the heathen worldview, but what happens in that moment of truth? Have they done anything? Has there been any kind of pursuit of wisdom or pleasure or friendship in their life? Again, I go back to Epicurus. <laughs> Epicurus that, that says, uh, oh my gosh, you see it was beautiful too. Where'd you go? 
I'm still here. Oh, okay. I'm still here. I, to, I had an idea and I lost my mind, but I'll, I'll get it back. Because <laughs> I had an idea and I'm just here. Uh, right? So I'm not the only one. I can't find it, but it's all, it, you know, that, that Epicurus philosophy has kind of really caught my eye because it, it really, you know, it really backs up a lot of, from a Greek point of view, I mean, I'm sure the Hellenes will appreciate it more than we will, but I find those same principles in our law, but we, and that's part of what we're doing in, in, re, in, um, in reinvigorating this faith and rekindling this fire, this kinos, this torch of inspiration that our ancestors held. Much of what we're doing is being in this moment as we breathe to be able to see down that path and perhaps catch a glimpse of that torch of inspiration that our ancestors hold for us in wherever they may be. Because that's, that's the real deal here. All of what we're doing in life, we can go along through life and do all kinds of things. But when it comes time to die, now what? Have I wasted my time? Am I being foolish? Have I done nothing more than build my ego? What have I done with this time talking about all this awesome true stuff? Have I built security in the future of what this energy will become after this is all said and done? Nobody's asking that question. Nobody's, everybody's sitting there trying to figure out who's right or who's wrong. But I just, by the 18th century, there were a thousand books read on, written on this Teutonic religion and all of them based on the political correct climate of the time. Um, and not one of them providing understanding of the original two source documents. So now what do we I do? just got to say, Brian, Go yeah, I don't yeah. actually believe in an after afterlife at all, but I love listening to what you have to say because your knowledge of the Eddas is far superior to anything I know about. Um, and so I like to be in touch with our ancestry, you know what I mean, through understanding the myths and not just the Eddas, but all the, you know, Indo-European myths and stuff, right? right? But I don't personally believe in an afterlife. You know, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, no. there's nothing wrong with that. And when you, if, so there's a certain kind of individual. My grandfather was most likely that kind of individual. He said, when he was okay. done, he was done. And, and to, when you put that in context and say, no, I'm not going to capitulate at this moment. Holy cow, that guy needed a, a wheelbarrow for his balls as far as I'm concerned. There's a lot of people uh. that, there's a lot of people that say, we got to have something after this is over because I'm not sure what kind of, so that, that belief system determines the honor with which you live your life, doesn't it? Because if you don't believe in anything after this, now all of a sudden every single moment takes on a hell of a lot more importance, doesn't it? Nobody's going to remember yeah. the best day watching TV. If you're living life right here and right now, now you're, hey, this, this moment's important. I don't get another one. They don't give me yeah, any this more. Is, the, yeah. So there's, there's only one you. That. That's all right. That's there's right. only one you, and this is only one chance you get, like, I believe. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I would never argue against that thought process. Uh, I, I really hope that after it's all said and done, that you might be pleasantly surprised and I could be more right than you, but I don't know. So I, can't. I want to know. I, I kind of wish right? I could die. For like, I always kind of wish I could die for five or 10 minutes and see. Yeah, just that. take a look. Let me get a peek at all this nonsense. What the fuck's yeah, going on over here? <laughs> I, you know, honestly, I think that's what, I think that that's what the trance state that the Oracle at Delphi was so renowned for. I think that, you know, cause there was more in that need than just alcohol. You know, there was other kinds yeah. of substances, and each man in his own home had the right to make that connection with the divine. He had jurisdiction over his own consciousness, and he could approach oh. these things um, if he so decided to use mushrooms, if he wanted to use ayahuasca, if he wanted to use marijuana. Those things were not illegal, but he still understood he had to behave in his society. Have you heard the theory about the gases, that nitrous oxide gases oh, yeah. that they said come out of the floor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She could I have been stone on nitrous uh, oxide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whoa. So, yeah, exactly. absolutely. I mean, I mean, shit. You get me walk up there and believe anything she says. <laughs> Here, smell this. <laughs> and you know, so 
Here's the thing, though, is that when we there's there's seven billion people on the planet. And, and, and if I'm sitting here talking and I get 300 people to say, hey, that's great, or I get a like, or I get, I got 5,000 people on my friends list on Facebook, 5,000 on Austria Book of Days, hey, that's good. That's fine and dandy. Some people might have found a kernel of truth to help them live a better life. That's all I give a shit about. But there are 7 billion people in the world. So I'm a hell of a long way from creating a better mouth train. So if I'm sitting here saying, no, you can't believe that, there is something and there must be, who the fuck am I to say that? You know, I mean, that's well, it's just, really interesting too the the origins of of the old Norse words and things like that, like the, the meaning behind the words. You, you know, um, in mistranslations yeah. and things like that. You know, there so on the internet. I'd like to learn a lot. Uh, go to the Internet Sacred Text Archive and look up Icelandic, and you'll find the poetic and the prose. It's the one I use. It gives the definition oh, of many of these names. It gives the definition of what they mean. And it's an interesting insight. Valerie Wright has long said that if you, she learned German so she could read the German versions of much of this research. And some of what, I mean, Germans would just make up a fucking word, you know? They'll just make some shit up. And the Swedish will too. Uh, and right. it doesn't translate neatly into English. Mm -mm. You know, so there's- Well, it's kind of like our version, our version of like how the Hebrews, you know, you're not asking any fucking questions. You're just basically comparing fucking brain pans here, having a conversation. Stop it. No. <laughs> Who is it? Oh. It's interesting. I'll have a conversation all day. It's my deal. Thank you. Do you have a question, Dave? <laughs> have you a question? No. Here's raw nasty. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, we are measuring. No. This is actually become a dick measuring contest. I'm sorry it happened, but that's just the way things go. <laughs> my apologies. I thought I was muted and talking to my wife. That was so damn embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey, I'm not. I'm, I'm gonna be. I'll be. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hide. I'm not gonna hide it. Oh my gosh, you're you're killing me here, man. <laughs> Dude, I thought I was important for a second. I thought I was on a roll. <laughs> Woo, come on! I thought we was no, doing no, good. No, 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 no. <laughs> no like I said, almost had to come apart. I'm not gonna lie. I almost had to come apart. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna cover. I'm not. I'm not gonna try. I'm not gonna try and cover up. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but I am gonna apologize. No, it's, it's all right, man. We, it's, it's good. I don't know. Alyssa's just laughing at me because she knows exactly. No, I'm laughing at myself. <laughs> well, that's good, man. That's what friendship's all about. I mean, that's how we build it, isn't it? And, uh, that's what we do, guys. I mean, I, I think the whole purpose of this has got to be. This kind of because there's not enough of this. I mean, we have regional events um, every on the big holidays, but for the most part, there's so many of us kind of sitting around here. Uh, where do we go? That's the only reason this is here, man. That's the only reason this is here for us to. Well, and there's this whole big thing going on with the oh, you know, this materialism. You know, the Dave Martell side of things, then your side of things, and then just all these different <laughs> little facets of, uh, of shit, right? Yeah, that. Uh, one of these days, I'll tell you all about that. 